Okay, everybody. Hi. How you doing? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm excited and even a little bit surprised to see so many of you guys here at 8.30 on a Saturday morning. Um, as Woody just said, it must be the robots. That's um, right. Uh, so, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, I have to say that um, I just had a wonderful time yesterday, and I wanted to thank everybody for your incredibly interesting and substantive conversation. Um, it was so thoroughly and deeply constructive and interdisciplinary, um, I, was, I was floored. I really, I, really, I really was amazed. I mean, there were some moments where people, a, a, an economist was asking, you know, a law professor or something, an electrical engineer was coming in at, after that, and a communications expert. I mean, it's just, uh, this is exactly what we aim for, and I just want to say that I really appreciate it. Um, so yesterday, I, I uh, thanked a few people, um, and I want to uh, do that again, you know, this morning and, of course, again in the afternoon. Um, uh, first, I, I want to uh, thank our sponsors um, for making this possible. Um, we have had a slide up, uh, a slide up yesterday with them, but I'll just tell you, um, you know, one of the uh, special and, and, and big thanks to Intellectual Ventures, which is right here. Um, I guess we're in their backyard, or they're in our, our backyard, um, but they uh, are enormously supportive of this effort. Intellectual Ventures uh, understands uh, uh, these technologies, robotics, 3D printing. Um, they hosted uh, Tony Dyson, our keynote, uh, at their lab, and he was just blown away by what they're, what they're doing over there. So we're deeply grateful to Intellectual Ventures. Um, I also want to say thank you, and now that um, we have a, a rep, I actually didn't realize we had a representative yesterday from Littler Mendelssohn, but now we have one of their, one of their senior um, partners, Gary Mathiasen. But thank you very much to Littler Mendelssohn. Um, as I said yesterday, and I say again, um, you know, one of the ways you know that robotics law is a thing is if large international companies like the biggest labor firm in the world uh, are, have a robotics practice group. That's one good indication uh, that, that, that this really matters. Um, and so, and we've been in dialogue for some time and in fact uh, um, uh, been talking about doing something around, around labor and, and, and robotics uh, uh, got going on a, a year, a couple years now. So I'm so excited that we're actually going to be doing that. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you to your to your uh, partner. Is it uh, Natalie or N Natalie, Natalie? Great. Thank you very much, Natalie. Where, where are you, Natalie? Are you here uh, right now? Should be here yet? Okay. Well, she was here yesterday with us. Um, um, I also like to thank uh, uh, the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. Um, again, another indication of whether something matters is if boardrooms are paying attention to it. Um, and we have uh, it, well, uh, Dan Siciliano is its executive director, but I've known him for going on six, uh, six, seven years here now, and we've been collaborating around our robotics law for, for all that time at, at Stanford Law School, but we're very, very grateful for the repeated support by, by the Rock Center, um, as well as the Center for Democracy and Technology, uh, Google, which has been a longtime sponsor and, of course, deeply invested in robotics, um, uh, and, uh, and also a big uh, special thank you to, to Microsoft. And uh, Sue was here for part of the day yesterday, but um, but going to be here with us today. Yeah, there she is. Hi, Sue. Um, <laughs> so one thing that I, I didn't – so I mentioned um, uh, Microsoft yesterday, of course, but one thing I didn't mention is in addition to supporting the conference itself, um, in partnership with uh, Georgetown, uh, with its communications department, um, and specifically Meg Jones, who I know is, I don't know if she's here right at this moment, but she's now in, in town, um, and so she'll be here through, for part of the day. Uh, what, they, what, what they did is they got together and they um, uh, got a bunch of student uh, scholarships and partial scholarships, which is the first time we've done that. So a bunch of students, including internationally, um, were able to come here uh, because of a generous uh, a partnership between between Microsoft and and Georgetown Communications Department, so we're very very grateful about that as well. And I hope you meet them; they're very interesting people and um, and uh, uh, future uh, and present stars of, of robotics law. Um, so you know, thank you to, to all the, to all those folks. Um, I also thanked the program committee, but I wanted to you know thank you each by name. Um, and I know that uh, uh, most of you are here. Um, so that's Howard Chizik, who, as you know, wrangled the robots for us. Um, he was sitting there, but he moved. Uh, Howard, this is, <laughs> this is uh, you know, you teach, right? Don't you hate it when your students move all over the place and you go to, you know, refer to them and they move to a different, you, you, you got to get the seating chart. You got to get the, yeah, sorry. Um, 
Uh, Jody Forlitzi, who I don't actually know if I've seen Jody yet here, but, um, but she's been a, a wonderful partner uh, for us and was on the program committee. She's a, in human computer interaction at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Michael Frumkin, of course, uh, who is uh, erstwhile uh, program chair and founder of, of We Robot. Um, uh, Dan Siciliano, who I've already mentioned with Stanford Law School. Um, roboticist uh, extraordinaire Bill Smart, um, who uh, did a fantastic um, a demo yesterday and uh, uh, has been a very a vigorous participant. And uh, Holly Yenko, who I know is here um, from um, uh, in computer science at University of Massachusetts uh, Lowell. Um, and so as you can see, of course, our, our program committee uh, is comprised of human robot interaction, uh, electrical engineering, computer science and engineering, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as law. Um, so thank you to you guys. Um, and then uh, just as profusely as yesterday, I would like to thank all the amazing staff at the University of Washington School of Law who were so supportive. Uh, all of our great volunteers who come from both the law school and the School of Information, um, and, uh, and especially, especially to Emily McReynolds, <laughs> who, uh, one more round of applause for Emily. Thank you. This is, I, I had a couple of, uh, and we're, we're going a little bit over time, but we'll, we'll build the time back in. Um, um, I, uh, uh, I, I uh, had a couple of conversations yesterday with people, and, and they're like, how are you doing? I was like, oh, you know, it's, I have this big conference or whatever, and it's been really you know, exhausting. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, Emily is doing all the work. And I was, like, I was like, yeah, but I have to, like, answer a couple of emails, like, every day about asking, you know, that she, she, like, tees up these, like, sort of carefully worded questions, like, you know, once a week, and I have to answer those questions. So it's been, it's been stressful for me. Um, you know, we, we, we really appreciate you. And, and as, as you know, she's the, uh, the program director of the Tech Policy Lab. Um, Okay, that was a lot of logistics, and we'll, we'll, we'll get that time built back in. Um, I am uh, super, super excited um, for uh, this paper, to talk about this paper today. Um, it, 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 it's a big deal to me, I mean, to be able to, to be commenting on, on Woody's work. We have been in dialogue, um, really the deepest dialogue of, of, of any uh, of my um, colleagues in the academy on issues of privacy and robotics. Uh, Woody's been a participant um, uh, since the beginning, doing wonderful interdisciplinary work. And this, I think, is his first solo authored We Robot. Um, and it's a set of issues that are near and dear to me. Also, it will, I hope, finally dispel um, all the uh, rumors and concerns that, uh, that Woody and I are the same person. You can see that we're two <laughs> different people. There's no, there's no special effects. That's Woody. This is me. We're different. Um, and so, uh, so I, what I'm going to do, of course, is I'm going to summarize this paper, and then I'm going to make some comments. And then I know that you guys have a lot to say about this, because everybody keeps coming up to me uh, saying how they want to talk about this paper. So I'm going to try to build in a lot of time. Um, so it's a paper called Unfair and Deceptive Robots, um, which is an awesome title. Um, and uh, and what, the, what the basic uh, idea is, is that, uh, is that at least with respect to consumer protection issues in robotics, that the Federal Trade Commission is in a good position to deal with the things that are going to arise, even though those things are, are novel or particularly acute harms. Um, and so... Uh, it starts with a claim that I think uh, a lot of people here are willing to accept, that, that robots, broadly defined, um, are coming into greater and greater contact with consumers. Um, and that robots create certain vulnerabilities having to do with our expectations uh, and arguably our, our arguably hardwired reactions, but, or at least our empirically testable reactions um, uh, to them. Um, and, uh, and one of the real well, part of what lends this paper such richness uh, is the great examples that Woody has come up with. Um, he probably has like a folder of these and just has been collecting them over time because they're so great. Um, uh, one has to do with a sort of classic problem but, but particularly acute, um, which is the idea that robots, almost uniquely as consumer products, create the prospect of um, over, overclaiming. Um, and this is a, a problem like imagine... Um, robotic demos where uh, they're sped up to make the, because robots do things very, very slowly. Um, and often demos will be sped up and you won't know that. And so if you see the Berkeley PR2 folding laundry, 
um, you know, it looks really cool because it's like, do, 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 but in fact, it's just like, do, 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 and you're like, oh my God, I can't watch this thing fold a sock for more than 10 minutes. Um, and so there's this possibility of, 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 de of deception inherent in the idea that this is not really uh, what it's doing. Another example of that is uh, so-called Wizard of Ozing, which as you might imagine, it's the idea that um, you're making something look uh, like it's uh, actually artificially intelligent and, and you're interacting with, um, with, the, with the machine, but actually there's like a couple of people uh, off in some room. And I can tell you, this is a very powerful phenomenon. I brought a bunch of my students uh, for, a, for my robotics law and policy class over to Peter Kahn's lab. I don't know if Summer's here right now. Is she, is she, she was here yesterday. Uh, yeah, you, there you are. Hi. <laughs> um, and so um, uh, you know, we, we went over to, to your lab, and you, you recall, and, uh, and so um, I brought a bunch of students there, and, uh, and they, did this, they did this experiment. Um, and there was this incredible sort of interaction with the robot there. I won't give you the details of it in case any of the material is not yet published, but there was this really great interaction where they're talking about the coffee in Seattle and going back and forth. And so after the robot has done its thing, um, I ask people, you know, my, my, these, these students in my class, and I say, um, so how, much, how many of you guys think that, like, the, the robot was, like, doing that, all that, like, on board? Like, like, the capability for doing that was, like, right there with the robot? And, like, all these hands went up, you know? I mean, the, the computer scientists, of which there were a number, were chuckling to themselves, but all the law students were like, that sounds correct. This robot is amazing. <laughs> um, and I said to them, I was like, guys, if, if a robot could do what just happened in this lab, the Nobel Prize Committee would stop whatever they were doing and they would immediately <laughs> fly to this lab and give them a prize because that's not how these things can do. And so there's these expectations. We believe these things and so um, There's also the prospect of uh, outright deceiving consumers over social media and the examples of that, I just could not commend them enough, but there are all these examples that are really happening um, of, uh, of, of deception over social media by, by, by bots. You know? And so he's, in this paper I should say, he's committed to the to the broad notion, I said broadly defined robotics, because he's also incorporating software bots, and we can talk about that a little bit. Um, it, it, they're, they're good at extracting information from people. He's got examples about bots um, uh, uh, being particularly good at getting information. Some of those date back to Ian Kerr's great paper that you cite, uh, the Californication of Commerce, about these chat bots that try to get uh, you know teenagers to, to to respond to them so they can get demographic information yeah. about them. And but there's but there's more and more examples. Um, one of my favorites is. Uh, uh, this idea of, of nudging people to borrow from behavioral economics, which has come up a couple times. And this is the idea that you have these bots on Tinder, which is a dating site, um, and the bots like try to get you to talk to them, but you have to like download an app in order to talk to them, you know what I mean? And then they disappear because they were never there. Um, and, uh, and so it's, uh, and this is really happening. This is not as, it's not as making this up. Um, one that is much more speculative is the idea that your, uh, your Roomba would endear itself to you um, and, uh, and you'd be really excited about your Roomba, so sweet and everything else. Uh, and then the Roomba would be like, gosh, you know, um, all the other Roombas got this software upgrade for fourteen ninety nine, and I just sort of feel like... I should get that. I mean, you don't, you don't have to get it for me. It's, it's all good. I'll still vacuum your floor for you. But I'm just saying if I had to upgrade. And so, like, you My know, heart's so, not in it, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and, then you, and then you have to put, cost like $14.99 and you have to get an upgrade, right? And if that sounds crazy to you, actually there have been examples of, of this, um, like these virtual girlfriends in, uh, in, in uh, 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 Japan uh, that that like interact with people and then and then ask to to buy gifts that cost real money or pets that you know this is another example that you use like pets that you have to pay money to keep them alive or virtual stuff um, and this this is uh, uh, really uh, cutting edge work and of course great examples for Kate's uh, own work um, I, I I thought about this later but there's um there's a bit in Robot Futures from Illa uh, Norkabish at, over at MIT that that goes into this a little bit um, but I'll send that that to you. Um, uh, automated decision making is another example where basically you're just sorted just like that by an algorithm. Um, um, you know, uh, one thing that did surprise me was uh, I, don't, I didn't see any discussion about that, that data uh, directive in the EU data directive about the right not to have an autonomous decision made about you. You remember that? So, yeah. so that was the, the, but so in, in Europe. Uh, under the current EU data directive, you actually have the right to have a person make a decision if you if you want. Um, but anyway, the idea is that is that this is automated decision making. Um, 
Um, and then, uh, and then uh, in, in, a, in a provocative, but I think not fully developed part of the paper, um, there's this idea of cyborgs, the idea that people would, would have um, implantable devices and that they might lack in security um, and, they, and, and they might uh, uh, cause other kinds of troubles. But I think that that was a provocative, but, but as yet, um, and I'm sure Woody would agree, not fully developed part of the, of the paper. Um, so, so this is just a tour. I mean, you should read the, I mean, I, I imagine and hope you read the paper itself. It's just got one great example after another. Um, and so that's part one. So, you know, these robots have to create these vulnerabilities and they're getting deployed or they could get deployed. Um, the second part uh, of the paper um, is, uh, I, I've just sort of subtitled it, um, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is awesome at its job. That's basically <laughs> that. Um, and, and Woody would know because he is one of the deepest experts on the Federal Trade Commission's uh, privacy um, uh, enforcement and security enforcement in the country. I mean, he and... And Dan Solov and, and 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 Chris Hufnagel and Marsha Hoffman, who was a trailblazer. I mean, that you know, that's the that's the pantheon of people studying this very very closely, practically. Um, and so he knows a lot about it. And so one real great thing about this paper, in addition to the richness of the examples, um, is that uh, he canvasses the FTC's, the Federal Trade Commission's authority to police unfair and deceptive practice. He n remarks upon their diverse and effective toolkit to protect consumers, uh, especially online. Um, and he runs through the surprising breadth and diversity of recent Federal Trade Commission actions. And so especially for those of you not familiar with the FTC's work, I highly commend this, recommend this part. Um, and then he makes the logical next step, which is to say that, look, given all this toolkit that they have, and uh, the robot can hand, sorry, the FTC can handle robots, right? Um, the FTC can handle robots too. Um, you know, and, and he continues this sort of, uh, 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 case for the FTC's um, likely ability to do this, and he says, look, robots are not so different, I'm quoting here, from other technologies and trade practices, um, that the FTC's theories of design and direct liability, data protection, and so forth would be inapplicable. I mean, obviously, that is to say that um, the FTC's handled a lot of interesting emerging technologies and so forth. Um, uh, I did make the conscious choice not to get uh, into the FTC's theory of design and so forth, these exact legal, um, these exact legal categories, but look them up in Woody's paper and especially see the discussion in his uh, FTC and the common law. I mean, you know, so th th there's a lot there, but uh, we can talk about that if you guys are curious about what those theories are. Um, the FTC plays well with other agencies. Um, and uh, uh, earlier in the paper, so this is not actually in toward the end of the paper, but early in the paper he also makes a claim that I'd like to talk about a little more, which is, and this is at page 27 rather than in the 50s, what I've been talking, that the FTC is acutely sensitive to the manipulation of vulnerable populations. Um, so that claim is made early on, uh, but it also seems to me germane to the, to the, to w w the applying uh, FTC toolkit to robotics. Um, okay. So, um, in terms of my own commentary, uh, you know, like I said, there is so much to like here, right? I mean, from the, the clear novel thesis to the wealth of knowledge and expertise that the author brings to the project. Um, the examples are fantastic and they're grounded, they're not out there. Um, and you can see the beginning uh, of the FTC's work immediately, right? And you can, you can see how the FTC might bring this toolkit to bear in the near term. Um, and not just the FTC. I mean, um, we talked about the Department of Justice uh, Antitrust Division recently filing a complaint against Autobots, essentially, right, which is your category, that are engaged in price fixing on Amazon Marketplace. Um, I, I broadly agree with Woody that um, the FTC does have the toolkit and, and the capacity and the track record to deal with unfair and deceptive robots in the consumer context. Um, especially if there's a Federal Robotics Commission around to help, which <laughs> I appreciated that little nod. That yeah. seems like a very wise That's idea. A, that yeah. doesn't, um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but, but the idea there would be that, 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 that there would be some certain, Woody dispenses with the concern that robots are different by saying, look, you know, yeah, robots are different, but the FTC is really good at finding out what it needs to know. And I think that that's, that's true. Not all agencies are, but the FTC, FTC absolutely is. Okay, so... Um, and so in that way, there's not much of an attack surface here, right? I mean, it, it, you know, it's, a, it's an expert person making a tight, sound argument, you know, that's novel and interesting. So it's not, it's not like a lot of attack surface. Um, but I do want to offer a couple different 
import, I think important directions, whether it's for future work or I think at least to acknowledge in this paper. Um, these are things that I think that the FTC will not, will not be able to do for a variety of reasons. Um, and one of them is, is uh, long-standing conversation, um, I suppose, long, in the last few years. Uh, so you invite the observation that the kinds of robotic privacy harms include situations where uh, the robot is not necessarily collecting more information, but rather that its mere presence in the room, in your car, on your device, um, and your physiological response to the presence of an anthropomorphic agent in your midst might interrupt opportunities for solitude. The idea is that you'll never feel alone because you're, the robot is always there. And you think about what it's like to be in the presence of a person all the time. That's what it's like to have Jibo on your desk all the time. Okay? Nothing in the FTC's, or at least, or at least you'd have to extrapolate a little further to find ways that the FTC would address that kind of thing. Now, I know that they've addressed all kinds of interesting um, um, design issues under unfairness. Um, they had experts like um, uh, Jen King over at Berkeley testify, who's a human-computer interaction specialist. So they get it, but I don't think that case was made. Um, and I think that's a real harm, as you know from my own work. Um, another thing, and this has been something I've been thinking about a lot lately. I'm writing something for the Chicago law review for a symposium, and I'm used sort of talking about this, but um, you, you, the, what about all the privacy and security harms where the bad actor is not um, another corporation or something like that or a hacker, but it's the federal government itself? How is the Federal Trade Commission going to push back let me say it this way. When a company promises that they will push back against the federal government, but then they fail to do so, who's going to enforce that? Not another federal agency. Do you see what I mean? And so when companies like Microsoft, like Google, like others push back, we say to ourselves, oh, that's great. It's a great market-oriented result. But if they said, we promise not to you know, capitulate to the government, and they didn't do anything, who's going to go after them? Right? I mean, if the FTC tried to do that, Department of Justice would be all over that. Yeah. And so that's, a, that's an interesting thing, I think, because what it does is it means we don't really have that affordance. We don't have that legal affordance, ultimately. We, 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 we can't, uh, uh, the whole system is predicated on the idea that, the, that, that these uh, companies are going to make implicit and, and express claims about privacy, but when those involve government uh, um, you know, uh, collection, there's no way for them to f enforce it. Now, I understand that you're talking about the consumer universe, but I think I would be sort of more specific about that, and I think it's important to explore. Um, another thing I'd say is that, uh, you know, my colleague, uh, Phil Howard, um, working with students at the University of Washington, like um, Sam Woodley, who's actually in, in one of my um, classes, they work on how Twitter bots are being used to influence politics. For instance, uh, uh, fake bots that pad a follower uh, account for a politician, making the politician look more popular than he or she is. Um, uh, bots that uh, respond to a particular hashtag um, uh, to say that uh, climate change is bullshit or something like that. You know what I mean? And these are bots, and they're, and they're relatively sophisticated. Um, and they're deployed in all kinds of ways but given the fact that it's political in nature and therefore non-commercial, um, it seems to me that while the, uh, the exact same mechanisms that you outline are, are, are at play, the FTC is not going to be able to do anything about them. Uh, maybe it could be instructive to the uh, Federal Election Commission or something like that, but it's not, it's not going to be addressing them. Um, I think that's important both because of the non-commercial nature and also because of the heightened free speech concerns. The idea that when you're talking with bots, you're, you're speaking, perhaps. And therefore, and this really is a criticism that I think you do need to, in my view, the other things I think you can, you can, a lot of them you can gloss, but I think you do need to address this, which is the entire project would do, I think, well to track the ongoing debate about whether or not machine speech is speech for First Amendment purposes. And there's work on this now. Like Tim Wu has that paper and, and Stuart Benjamin and... Um, um, uh, Ron Collins and David Scover are writing something about this. And so there, there's some work on this, right? Um, 
And I, I think that figuring out what of this kind of conduct is speech and what of this kind of conduct is conduct, let's say, will help you understand how well equipped the FTC is to pursue it and not be worried about a serious pushback like the FDA is getting around graphic warnings and so forth. Um, so that, that's what I have. I mean, in, in, in sum, you know, this is a, a timely and worthwhile project with a clear path toward, toward uh, excellence and, uh, and already, already mostly there. Um, I, I know that you, you all are probably eager to jump in, um, but I do want to give um, Woody the chance to, to sort of make any reactions to my comments. But thank you very much for this. It was a delight to read and engage with. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Ryan. So I was, I was, A, I'm thrilled to see you all here, and I appreciate it. B, I was thrilled to see that Ryan um, was going to be commenting on my, my paper. I think that um, you may have noticed that I am, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that I cited literally every single thing that Ryan has ever written in the paper. Um, and that may be a first. And, and not only that, but, but um, Ryan was being um, very charitable. So um, I contacted him when I found out that, that he would be commenting on the paper. And we, we kind of preliminarily exchanged a few ideas. <laughs> And then he said, you know, one of the things that I'm going to uh, uh, probably bring up is that, you know, robot demonstrations are, are, are problematic because sometimes they can be sped up. I'm like, sweet, that's going in the paper. He's like, damn it, now I don't have anything to say. <laughs> and so... So I did to Michael right. yesterday, yeah. Yeah, and so... so um, so uh, this paper was actually probably, you know, at least partially co-authored by Ryan. So... Um, and so that's why his criticism is, is so, is so uh, gentle because it's, he knows that he would be... Uh, uh, harming himself on this. But I will, so let me just take a brief second to respond to the criticism. Um, uh, you're right. So the FTC, and, and I, I try to admit this in the paper, that the FTC, while it's the preferable regulatory agency um, to regulate consumer robotics, is limited. And that's, uh, and that's even in, in, notwithstanding the fact that Section 5 is, is a very broad statute that allows it to regulate unfair and deceptive trade practices, an intentionally broad statute um, that Chris Hufnagel is, is working on a book right now on the Federal Trade Commission, and it's going to be uh, amazing. And he's going to talk about kind of the process by which Congress decided to make Section 5 as broad as it did. Um, and, and, and But even notwithstanding that, the, the Federal Trade Commission has its limitations, and one of the main ones is that it's limited to, to commercial actors. So that means that nonprofit agencies, notably schools, for example, um, that perhaps deploy robots will, will not fall within its protection unless it's been granted authority by Congress to do so. Um, and, and politics is, is a big one, and I'll get to that in a second. But first, um, the presence of, of robots um, and the, the harm that we experience from always having a robot, that's, um, that I think you have to admit that that's not going to to fall within the FTC's bailiwick um, because the FTC, particularly with respect to its unfairness jurisdiction, is limited by a, a certain kind of conceptualization of harm that I don't think extends to the kind of harm that you've articulated in your, in your previous work. And a lot of that is because this harm is very incremental. Um, the FTC has a, a very interesting theory about kind of small incremental harms to a, a broad subset of people, but even then, even under that theory, I'm not sure that kind of the presence of robots in your homes, the unsettling effect of, of robots in your homes is actionable under that theory. And, and so maybe then the right move is to say, but that's a, that's a larger policy issue, right? So we don't always make, and this is something that we actually, one of the very few things that I think we, we maybe um, have something to talk about, which is that we don't always make privacy laws to prevent against harm. Sometimes we do so for other policy concerns, or the harm is so minuscule that it's not worth kind of pinning it down, but it is something that we want to protect against. And so as a, as a policy point, perhaps, you know, this is, we kind of section that off and say, if we want to handle that, then we do so through, through different legal um, mechanisms. As for the who, you know, who pushes, who regulates when um, the government uh, comes knocking on a company's door and the company doesn't do what it says it's going to do, which is to maybe resist process or something like that. I, I think that's a great point. Um, the FTC and the DOJ have a, a, a relatively um, ongoing working relationship, particularly with a lot of cases, and I think that that would complicate things dramatically for the FTC to then go after, um, you know, the DOJ, and so, so that's probably not going to happen. Um, 
But then again, I would probably then take that out and say, but that's you know why we need structural government surveillance reform, right? And 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 that's that's why we have those laws, um, and you know why we need uh, better laws. Um, we need to you know, uh, and we can talk about that debate if you want to as well. Um, bot in, bots influencing politics is a very interesting question, and maybe one that we could we could talk about. What would laws like that look like, right? So would it be enough to kind of grant the FTC a waiver, you know, and, and or grant them a, a, some kind of grant of authority over, um, you know, this, or is, is because this is core political speech, which, you know, bleeds directly into your next question, um, or, or your next uh, uh, criticism, is, is that untouchable, right? So if, if we, it, it, because this is, if we say that algorithms are speech, then if, someone creates an algorithm that is specifically designed to um, participate in the political process, then have we just granted an incredible amount of protection to really problematic forms of manipulation? Um, maybe not, right? So my answer to the, the you know, what is speech, like at, at what point are we getting into the, the machine speech question, Felix Wu, um, had a presentation one time, he, he had a paper called The Ontology of Speech, and he said, we, we always start these debates by asking, like, what is speech, right? And he said, that's a silly question because you can say that about literally anything, right? He said, making a chair is my, you know, expression of how I think a chair should look like. Um, and he said, and so that's the wrong question to ask out of the gate, and I, I, I found that to be very compelling. Um, and so the, the, the much better question is, you know, what's the governmental action that we're talking about here? And is it problematic for free speech purposes? And, and with respect to what I propose in the paper, I would say that a lot of what I talk about that does get into some problematic free speech concerns are the disclosures, mandated disclosures, which is what the FDA is running up against, because this is compelled speech, right? But we know that mandated disclosure regimes can be constitutional, uh, because we have mandated disclosure regimes all over the place. And so, um, including the FTC's current disclosure regimes, where they make you, um, you know, there, there are certain, and I articulate this in the paper, and I say there are certain um, times when you actually have to disclose something. You have to disclose it in a particular kind of way, right? So it's not enough to bury it in the fine print, which is what I find um, perhaps most promising about the FTC's jurisprudence is that they're not hamstrung by traditional contractual principles where you can bury some kind of notice in the fine print and they say, you consented to it. Um, the FTC has had a number of cases that I, I think I talk about in the paper where they, they simply don't accept that argument. Um, and, and actually with that, um, I don't want to talk anymore because I, there are a lot of really interesting, smart people here, and I would much rather hear what you have to say. And so um, let's get to the questions. Um, as people are queuing up, um, I just want to uh, make one, one response. Sure. Uh, so, so I think that uh, one of the recurrent themes that we robot is, how is this robot-y? You know what I mean? Like, and, and, mm -hmm. right? and so we had a conversation that was I think, really productive yesterday about what is it that makes the, the unique that it's about robots. And I just want to make two observations that are totally off the cuff. Um, one is that uh, um, these kinds of questions, like for instance, um, the idea that you would have subtle harms by virtue of never, never feeling alone, right? Um, this might help us uh, test what, what the limits of privacy by design are. Mm. Be because privacy by design is, su is supposed to be this sort of magical hand wavy way to, to instill privacy by design. And so it ends up being m greater in some scope than the sort of more um, tightly articulated uh, FIPS and so forth, right? Does it encompass this sort of thing? Why or why not? Is privacy harm more than the sum of, I'm sorry, is, is privacy by design somehow more than just designing FIPS? Oh, you absolutely, see what I mean? yes. And, so, and, and some people think it is, and other people don't, don't think so. And so robots might be a neat, neat place to sort of figure that out. Um, yes. So, yeah. So, go ahead. Now please. that I've invited questions, let me just respond very no, briefly. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, I, that's absolutely right. And I'll if you, stop there, yeah. if you, so, so I'll make a general point that you're going to hear me be saying a lot more over the next couple of years, which is that design is one of the most important things that we should be talking about uh, with respect to technolo technological issues. Um, and if you look at what the Federal Trade Commission has done, is it's articulated a theory of design boundaries, or at least it's beginning to right now. And it started with things like spyware. 
right? So uh, there, there are certain things about the design of spyware that make it problematic, and the FTC has articulated this. One of the things is that it's undetectable. Right? So when you design a certain technology to be undetectable, the FTC says that's problematic for consumer purposes. And I think we can take that theory and, then, and, and maybe push upon the, the uh, design boundaries. And so I would say that, that not only um, you know, it, 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 privacy by design should be more than just the FIPS. Right? So the, the, the way that we articulate design principles should be much more than that. Um, and, and I hope to, tr to try to articulate that in, in future work. I'm, I'm eager to hear from people too, please. I think, Kate, you were first. Hi. I'm Kate Darling, MIT. Um, so, well, first of all, I think this is my favorite paper of <laughs> Thank the, you. this conference. Um, I really love it. Um, can I just ask the audience, who likes robots? <laughs> yeah, like that, that is a big reason for, for why I'm here. You know, I really love robots. And the other reason I'm here is that I truly believe that robots pose very distinct and unique challenges to ethics and social issues and the law. Um, but I also need to keep reminding myself that that is why we're here and that second part is what we need to be focusing on. And I think that in your paper you do a fairly good job of saying why you know, the embodiment of robots um, puts them in a different category. But I found the whole part on algorithms and bots to be a little bit hand wavy. And I think you hint at differences, but I'd like to hear you elaborate more on why this paper isn't about algorithms with a section on robots. Oh, so the idea that, that software is, is controlling a lot of this. Um, I think that to that I will probably fall back on Ryan's work. Right, and 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 because <laughs> since this paper is probably co-authored with Ryan, well, I just it's, it reminds me of like those author notes that say you know mistakes are my own. You're, right, you're, right. You're, 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 <laughs> I think the following right. people any mistakes are Ryan. That's right. That's yeah. right. So I blame Ryan if the theory doesn't hold up. Um, uh, the the short of it is that um, robots algorithms are an incredible part of of robots and and. Uh, I think that we were talking with, with Tony last night, and he said that one of the, the things that we talk, the, the difference between hardware and software, right? And that's, that um, everyone talks about innovation and hardware, but where all the action is in robotics, in, according to his opinion, was in software, right? And in software development. And so, um, and so I find it difficult to disentangle, except to the extent that um, the FTC has been tackling a lot of software issues lately. Um, when you automate them, that acts as a force multiplier. Um, I, I draw upon, so I, getting into the, so now I'll go ahead and bring uh, the Bill Smart, Neil Richards debate into this thing where he says, well, robots are just hammers. Um, you could say, well, algorithms are just software, right? And, and, um, but they're much more than that. And, and when you combine algorithms with embodiments, then you also get another unique um, addition, and so drones are an example of this, where you can now manipulate into particular spaces. Um, and so, um, I I tried to make the examples of of um, that I use to be more than just software. So I I mean I talk about uh, the fact that, um, and maybe I should do a better job of talking about. So I, I Boxy, for example, is is something that I use as. Um, a really interesting robot that collects a lot of information and is really good at that because it's cute and you want to disclose information to Boxy. And I wish I could embed video in the paper because the video of Boxy is even greater than, than the, the pictures, which is that it's, it's got this adorable little voice um, and so you want to tell it everything. Um, I think that Boxy would not be nearly as effective if Boxy were just a software bot, right? And so, and so maybe I should make that clearer, that, that it's Boxy's embodiment that, that matters. Um, in addition to its software program. Yeah, well, let's uh, Michael from Kenyon University of Miami. So this paper was a lot of fun to read, and it, it certainly convinced me that the FTC has a place in the regulatory ecosystem. But I want to inject a note of skepticism for the claim that it really ought to be the primary or main or organizing agency here. And I guess I got three reasons for that. Um, I mean, the first is, let's look at how the FTC regulates privacy. Um, I think we don't have very much 
privacy in this country right now, the privacy regulation. I don't think that's a success story. The FCC has been extremely successful in nibbling small pieces of the problem. But the problem is so much vaster than what the FTC has taken on that, that you know, I think that almost makes a case for why it's only part of a coordinated solution and not even the center of it. I mean, if that's your analogy, I think it's not persuasive to me because I don't see the other thing as anywhere near a victory. It's a, you know, a, it, it wins some skirmishes. Hmm. You know, and wins some important skirmishes, but it's nowhere near even fighting the war. Now, the second reason is, I mean, you see an analogy which comes up, you know, in some ways in the paper, car safety. I mean, would we, if we were thinking about how do we get car safety, say, oh, yeah, forget about NHTSA. Forget about automobile safety, crash standards, and all you know, airbags. And all that. Let's just have full disclosure. And, you know, it'll be unsafe and deceptive to say your car is safe, but, you know, if it's not safe, then, you, you know, it's a sports car, of course it's not safe, you know. Go ahead and kill yourselves on the road, 60,000 a year, we don't care. We would never say that anymore. Yeah. Um, so, and that's another reason why the FTC isn't the whole story, or even the majority, I think, of the story, because at the end of the day, robots are going to be more like cars in the ways, in, parts of the ways in which they can hurt people. Right? It's not just the information piece; it's the physical piece, right? I mean, it's that wonderful line which I stole from somebody, maybe Ryan, I don't know, somebody about how you know the difference between internet law and robot law is that you know, a, a robot is like an iPhone with, with a blowtorch attached. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was Paul. Oh, may have been. Yeah. I, I, st I only steal from the best. Um, <laughs> So, and, and, you know, similarly, I mean, the, the, the FTC's regulation, as you noticed, in, as you said in your comments, right, is about, regulates by roles, right, you know, so, so, so you know, in industries that sell to consumers, but robots are functional. They do things in the world, and logical regulation would be for all, you know, for, like, like with cars, right, the safety applies to whoever's driving the car, and it's the same thing with whoever's driving the robot. We don't care if it's a nonprofit, a government, whatever, for some, for some definitions of safety anyway. So that's why the FTC paradigm isn't, in many cases, going to be the best. And lastly, as, as I told you last night, I think the paper would benefit a lot from distinguishing between three different kind of actors in the robot space, right? So one is the manufacturers, where, where, where your case is, 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 is strong. Another is distributors, right? So people buy the robots to use them in some business function or something. And again, the case is strong, but, but slightly different, maybe stronger even. Because, and then the third is the end user. And I don't think the FTC has nearly as much teeth yeah. in regulating the end user's use as opposed to the person being used on. But of course, many times people will buy a robot to do something with. Um, so and, you know, so that, that's, you know, I think the paper would just be stronger and more convincing if you sold a little less hard, if you made some of these things. There's a lot of value in this paper. I'm, I'm not knocking it. I just think that the, 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 the claim is bigger than it can sustain. And it doesn't need to be that big because there's lots of great stuff in here without that. Thank you, Michael. I, I appreciate that. Let me, let me address the, the comments in reverse order. So with respect to chopping them up, I think that's a good idea to distinguish the three. Um, end users, absolutely, right? So the FTC can only regulate commercial actors and end users that are deploying the robots most likely will not be commercial actors. This is where I think design matters, right? So uh, I, I just published an essay recently where I say, um, you know, laws that prohibit kind of conduct um, are a varying effectiveness. Um, with, in the privacy world, people don't read terms of use. Um, a lot of people don't know about various privacy laws, but every single user of a technology must reckon with the constraints of that technology. And so this is why, um, you know, I've, I'm proposing a focus on design, and I think that the approach to design is good, because then we can kind of at least um, somewhat affect the, the actions of users, if not completely prohibit them, at least, you know, m mitigate potential harms of that use in some way. Um, with respect to car safety, uh, you make a good point, and I thought about your, your comment to me earlier that kind of would I say the same thing about cars? Would I have said the same thing that the FTC is the ideal regulatory agency for cars? And I think that there's a major difference that I'd like to go ahead and, and throw out there as to why the FTC should regulate robots but perhaps wouldn't be for better for cars, and maybe I wouldn't say the same thing about cars, um, is that it's physical safety, which you've identified. Right, so physical safety, if you see a technology that, that threatens physical safety, now robots can, right, and, and because they can manipulate, we will have physical safety issues, but A, we have products liability law for this, um, which supplements the FTC in many different kinds of ways, um, but B, if it's dangerous enough 
And I made this point, um, and this is where I, 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 I love Ryan's paper so much, it gets its own regulatory agency. The Federal Aviation Administration would not exist if planes didn't endanger lives, right? But it exists because we won't get on the plane before we know it's safe. The same thing with the NHTSA, right? So Kristen's paper, which I thought was magnificent, um, and I can't wait to see it in a, in a, in a more fleshed out form, um, highlighted this. Right, the idea that, that cars, we're not going to get into a car because you could die. Um, not all robots pose the same kind of physical safety issues, and so I propose that the FTC actually is better for this purpose um, precisely because of the spectrum that we have within robotics, right? So some robots might have some physical safety issues, and if you, if you uh, see my, my discussion on the amazing gut buster, right, um, then, then we do have some potential disclaimers for some kinds of injuries with respect to robotics. Uh, this paper is a paper that, that certainly it tries to acknowledge, and maybe I should do it more, the limitations of the FTC, but because there's such a much broader spectrum than a technology that has such dire health consequences and safety consequences, I think that I, I would push back on that. And then finally, um, as to whether the FTC does a good job based on privacy, that's a whole other debate. Um, I, I would say that the FTC actually does a, a pretty good job on privacy, um, at least given the, the resources that they have, and they can only file a certain number of complaints a year. Um, and they certainly do a better job, I think, on privacy with respect to their, the breadth of what they can cover. Um, just by, def by structure of the agency rather than other agencies. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I like the idea of incremental steps um, because we still don't know what all the harms are of robotics law yet. So. Well, I also <clears throat> just want to clarify something, Michael. I mean, you, you know, of course, that the FTC can regulate cars if what they're regulating is privacy violations by cars or deceptive, deceptive claims about cars. Or right? advertising. Or advertising. Cars. I mean, so, so it's, you're not talking about whether they should talk about cars versus not cars. You're saying safety issues versus not safety issues, right? Um, and and, and I, I just think that you could resolve that in part just by saying I'm talking about consumer protection in this sort of particular right. way, and, and there's all these other safety issues. Um, yeah, the FTC yeah. is not the <clears throat> cosmos, nor does it have to be the cosmos, right? And, and, and I... I would not want it to be. I don't think anyone would. We need, we need many hands make for a light load with respect to robotics. I think you're next. Evan, so, uh, Evan Selinger, RIT. So two things. Uh, one, as a taxonomy fanboy, this is a really fantastic paper. Really. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I can formulate this question well, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try to bring into dialogue some thoughts that I had after Kate's paper yesterday with the discussion this morning on sort of um, design issues. So here's how I'm thinking about it. So the, the haunting thought that I had after Kate's paper was maybe there are these kind of invariant sort of biological responses that we have to certain kinds of framing effects or, or what have you, maybe certain design features. But it's an ongoing debate, so we don't yet know, or at least there's going to be some controversy. So on the one hand, we could maybe, with an educated guess, predict ahead and say at some point, Right? The, 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 the dust is going to settle, and people are really going to be able to say, like, when you have these kinds of features within a certain kind of population, you really should expect these kinds of results. So looking ahead, we can see that. But I don't know if we're there quite yet. So the, the question that I'm starting to formulate is, if we're thinking about deceptive design and intention to deceive, at what point within these controversies about particular kinds of features engendering particular kinds of responses, like, when do we get to sort of say that a company that has, I mean, when you, when you narrate a scenario, right, of the Roomba going like, no, daddy, please, if you don't get, like, that's easy <laughs> to understand yeah. given the, the kind of situation, right, the kind of engagement, it's very manipulative. But I'm thinking in more a design case of this tweak or that tweak, looking this way, moving that way, at what point will a company be unable to say, well, we didn't expect this response, that's an unanticipated consequence or that's an externality. At what point do we say that these kinds of design features, if they're present, this is part of a deceptive operation? How do, how do we deal with the fact that on an empirical level, that's still kind of a debate, but we know that's a debate that needs to be answered and that design aspect is going to be very much part of this deceptive landscape? So this is, I think, one of the virtues of the FTC's approach to, pro to regulation generally, but certainly in the field of privacy and data security, which is that it goes incrementally and it only goes largely after the extreme cases, where it's relatively obvious that some kind of um, wrongdoing has occurred. Now, that's not always the case, but that's generally the FTC's approach. 
Um, and, and what this allows us to do then is to kind of get contours on the edges where we don't have to then um, really pin down the hard questions in the gray area just yet. And then over time, what you see is a pattern emerging, right? And, and so let's take, for example, data security as a really good example. Data security is, is um, at base, a, a lot of it is our design decisions, right? So how, what are the ways in which you safeguard um, databases, for example, and the way that you design databases? Now, it's also about organizational procedure and process. Um, when, you know, data security kind of starts off a long time ago, we, we, we still struggle to articulate, but, but over time we've seen um, a, a fairly clear picture of what constitutes good data security arise. We have international standards, and I try to cite this in the paper, we're seeing this with robotics now too, right? So international standards about, you know, ISO standards and NIST standards um, about the design of robotics. And I think what, what we, the, the answer would be, um, we move cautiously, which is what I would encourage the FTC to do here, is to not, you know, go in guns blazing, but rather just kind of articulate the, the far boundaries. And then over time, perhaps, we can get a, a, a conversation with industry, right? So because a lot of design decisions have to take place with what's feasible with respect to, to industry. Um, and, and this kind of co-regulatory approach over time, hopefully we will get uh, a much better picture in the same way that we have with a lot of privacy and data security issues. I would expect the same thing would happen with robotics. It just takes time. All right, it's just really high up. Um, Woody, it's an awesome paper. Uh, I think that um, my characterization of what it does is that it takes uh, Ryan's category of social valence and explains how one might deal with social valence, anthropomorphism, however you want to call it, um, in the privacy context, and I'd actually sort of gotten that from your common law of the FTC paper, but I'm really glad you've said it explicitly because now it is very citable. Yeah. Um, so, so just an <laughs> observation you. on that because I think it's interesting. Um, when you look to treatment of law enforcement use of deception, it's completely different from FTC treatment of deception. I just think, I think there's something interesting there. Elizabeth Joe has a piece up on Harvard Law Review Online about police use of basically lying and fraud, et cetera. Um, and in that context, it's almost entirely unregulable. So it might be worth putting in a little, if you're going to the extent you want to deal with law enforcement in this piece, to say, look, in the private actor context, we actually have an enforcement mechanism against using anthropomorphism for deceptive purposes, but in the government context, we don't. Problem. Um, okay, so then the two criticisms I have of the paper, or I guess feedback I have for the paper, um, one comes out of a symposium I was at last weekend, uh, where the wonderful Meg Jones um, and Yana Wellander from uh, Wikimedia both talked about the issue of the internet of other people's things, um, <laughs> which I think was actually Meg's phrase. It's an awesome phrase. Uh, if you haven't written that, Meg, for citation purposes, you That's should. Right. Um, <laughs> so the problem of the internet of other people's things is kind of what Michael was getting at, which is that if you have a system that regulates through the relationship between the manufacturer and the owner, you don't get at what the end user is doing. Um, and a lot of the privacy concerns that we have once we're dealing with things in real space involve what that end user does to another person. And that's not really governable via the FTC, even if the FTC can regulate deception, deceptive design. Um, so that's problem number one. Um, problem number two has to do with the voluntariness of the relationship between, um, or, sorry, the voluntariness of privacy policy adoption by the manufacturer. Um, and there I wanted to just flag what's happening in the drone context. So you have um, the president told the NTIA, develop best practices with respect to uh, behavior by private actors around drones. Um, and then manufacturers are supposed to adopt these best practices and the FTC will then enforce them. Um, and so the question that raised immediately for me was when you're in the drone space where you have a lot of innovators, uh, a lot of new players, what is going to cause them to want to voluntarily adopt those privacy policies other, from sort of the, other than sort of the general idea of like if they don't, bad things will happen and the market will collapse? California, maybe? <laughs> um, no, so, so that's a really great question. Thank you very much for all of those points. Um, with respect to the uh, law enforcement, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, the thing that immediately comes to mind was when they, everyone started creating fake social media profiles to... to, to to get people to disclose all kinds of information. The FTC has been very clear that you, this, this is pretexting, right? This has been very clear that you can't 
serve, a, 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 a commercial actor cannot serve as an imposter to elicit information. But when law enforcement does it, it it's, it's, a, it's a whole different ballgame. And so, so here's maybe where I, I concede to, to Michael um, and say we need more laws um, to, to prohibit something like that. Um, with respect to the Internet of other people's things, this is a hard question. Um, and um, I do think that, that uh, I'm going to be pushing on what the law can do with respect to design. Um, I think it can do more, frankly. I think that the FTC can do more, but I think that, that general, there are other kinds of regulatory mechanisms we could use to do more with respect to design. And I think the law should do more. Um, so not just deceptive design, but unfair design. Um, and I want to start articulating what that might look like, because even though um, there's uh, not much that the law can do with respect to person-to-person non-commercial actors and the way they treat each other, design creates affordances. Right, and, and people can, can use technologies to harm each other because the design of those technologies allows them to. Um, and, and there may be ways in which we don't want to restrict that, um, and there may be other ways in which we do. And, and I hope to push on that a little more, so I'm just going to cue that one for later and we can have a conversation about it. And then finally, with respect to um, uh, the voluntariness of it all, um, it's a really interesting story. One of the papers that, that Dan and I want to write is like a side project is how the very first privacy policy came to be. Um, and because these things just kind of sprouted up and nobody really knows why. And we tried to, to get at this. We tried to find the very first privacy policy. We think we found it, um, but I, I don't want to say it publicly because I don't know if I'm right or not. Um, but I think... Um, I think it happened in, in the mid-90s, and a lot of it just kind of occurred from a, uh, some really conscientious actors where they said, you know, we have no idea how much personal information we have. We should catalog it, and we should tell our users um, what we have. And I agree. I don't think the same motivation is going to be there for drones. And so maybe this is another place. And, and I said, I mean, the, the way that we should start regulating robots is, is actually simply we should look at um, disclosures, design, and organizational procedures. And this is an area where we might want to leverage disclosure regimes a little better. Can I make a, a small su- a suggestion? So um, I, you, you know that I could, I could hear you talk all day, and I, and I, and I, I would pref- I would prefer, you know, love to do that. In fact, I hope we can set up a time and you can just talk. But I was going to say, yeah. I, I think for per- – so I want to extend this conversation for about five minutes. And so what I recommend, which is um, – although it, it, uh, it will be unfortunate in the sense that we won't, we won't get your reflection, I wonder if we could get some comments yeah. and then – do you know what I mean? And maybe we could reflect on them all together, if yeah. that's okay. Sure. Um, you're, you're not at all going, going on. I, I just want to make sure we have more time because I, I took some time away. So we'll give another five minutes to take it off of the break. Um, I think Mike was next, and then Anupam. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I really like the like reading about the the potential role of the FTC, and I wanted to um, to get back to a, a, a nice uh, paragraph intro you wrote that we are a persuadable bunch uh, <laughs> talking about the human race, and um, I would we accept to be um, persuaded and deceived, and I would almost say that there are many instances where we want to be deceived. And this goes everything from, well, we're assuming somebody's looking over Mark Zuckerberg's shoulders when he's writing those 14 pages of terms and limits and conditions, and we click, okay, somebody's been there. But um, the other, there are other s- examples that get a little bit closer to robotics, and this is like us giving some agency to a ventriloquist puppet, you know, the mini-me sort of thing. Um, and also, I mean, there have been studies, and I'm, I was trying to remember which one, where the uh, a Wizard of Oz studies with human-robot interaction, they're trying to... Uh, parse something out, and then they show the participants that the robot is not a real robot, it is being a uh, Wizard of Oz. And then people continue to be deceived <laughs> and want to be deceived <laughs> because we want the robot to is doing something fun and they're getting an interaction out of it. Okay, so to some extent we want to be deceived, and I think that's really, that goes to the core of the, of the question that I, that I, I have uh, uh, in a minute. So, I, I mean, I teach engineering design. I've written about, you know, safety by design for assistive robots. And um, it's, it's really difficult to think about what does transparency actually mean. I mean, in some of the other papers, is robots must perform properly and safely and all that. But what does that transparency actually mean? And then when you buy a ladder in the hardware store, it's got the sticker on it, do not step here. The electrical cord has something that gets in your way when you try to plug it in. Those are in-your-face, real-time, always-on kind of reminders about use. But what does that mean for a robot? So is it, is it enough for the FTC to say you must you know, paint the robot red or that you must, do, you must advertise the abilities of the robot? 
And I would say that robots are perhaps somewhat um, special as a product category in the sense that there are a lot of latent capabilities that are not obvious to the average user all the time. So we expect robot, uh, sorry, cars to drive on roads to follow um, DMV's rules. But what about an Android walking down here? We don't know what its capabilities are. So I think uh, it's, it's really almost incumbent upon the designers to advertise you know, where on this uncanny valley we are, in this valley we are, and what it can do, and also for the robot to have the capability to actually advertise what it can't do. And I think that's, a, for the FTC, I think it's very easy to take a look at the one, but it's very difficult for us to design in the other. And I think that's, a, that's an area ripe for discussion, I believe, by designers and, and by programmers to, uh, to, to look at that. I, mean, I, was, uh, I was remembering like the, the movie uh, Her, so spoiler alert, halfway, most people have seen this, I assume, in this crowd. <laughs> Um, that three quarters of the way through, um, there's a conversation about how many people are you actually having this relationship with? And the, the guy is stunned that there are some 5,000 or something. It's like, what? <laughs> what? You're <laughs> cheating on me. Yeah. <laughs> so there is this, what does the robot do outside of the scope of the use of that's, that's going on? So anyway, I, I just wanted to bring up that what I consider maybe not a uniqueness, but a very special property and an opportunity for designers to uh, to explore a much larger space than what they've been considering. So we'll hear from Anupam, and then David, can I give you the first question next time if you if you have one? Apologies. Okay, because I do want to build in a small break here. P please. Anupam, Anupam Chander, UC Davis. Uh, thanks, Woody, for a terrific paper as always. Um, so I'm following up on Mike's uh, comment in, in part, which is, um, so how, what does the FTC mandate when it's confronted with a deceptive robot? Does it mandate uh, better disclosure, or does it mandate a change in the robot's capabilities or practices, right? Um, and if it's the former, uh, how, does, how is that disclosure to be, to be uh, uh, made? That is, are these robots supposed to walk around and you know, with huge signs indicating exactly what they can or can't do, uh, and so uh, you know to to ward off the kind of deception uh, as the as the uh, and that seems uh, largely unwieldy in some sense, unless there's a kind of uh, simple way to do do this, a kind of uh, you know a shorthand signaling devices that we might have, uh, a kind of set of accepted uh, you know uh, shorthands. Uh, that are available. So, so I'm just trying to, uh, you know, focus on uh, this. Normally, we think of the FTC and we think of advertising. We think of words and and pictures, uh, and we think of the response largely in terms of what you've said about the product, right? Uh, here, you're talking about a robot that's practicing, that's doing what it does but we're not sure exactly what it is uh, doing because we're deceived about the robot's uh, uh, actions. So it's a little bit um, unusual in some sense, uh, given the history of the FTC. That's right. So here's the point where I now remerge uh, into Ryan, and we become <laughs> Ryan Hartzog or Woody Kalo. Um, uh, so uh, I think that, A, we, we start with disclosures, right? And the FTC's general stance, and I tell my students this, like, when does the FTC require disclosure? Whenever it's necessary to avoid deception, right? Material deception, right? So not all deception. So there's a certain amount of deception. And, and to the other points, there's a certain amount of deception that we do not only tolerate but encourage, right? Because, because otherwise it would interfere with the functioning of the robot. So there are some robots where they need to believe, right? Not only do we want to believe, we need to believe some kind of of um, uh, deception in order to make the robot function, right? In order to ease its kind of transition and its adoption rates. And so that's, uh, and, and materiality is a very good question when we need to do a lot more research. Like, so what does materiality do with respect to what does it constitute rather than just words? I, I make the point, and I think I'm gonna flesh it out a little more in the paper, which is that robots are unique. And this goes to Kate's point, like what's different about robots? Robots are capable of disclosing things themselves. Right? So, so Boxy, for example, when, when Boxy records information, Boxy tells you, um, I'm going to use this information now. Is it okay? 
right? Um, and, and, and that's a little less unwieldy because we interact with the robot, right? So it's less problematic where you're like, oh, God, another terms of service agreement, right? And instead, it's like part of our interaction. Um, and so, to, so with that, I would say let's leverage, um, you know, Ryan's great work on visceral notice with robots and see what we can do with it. So thank you very much, all of you. Yeah. All right, so, um, so first of all, thank you so much, Woody. This was fantastic. Thanks for all the great questions. Um, this, the, the panel met and exceeded my, my high expectations, so I'm, I'm really happy about that. Um, let's give it uh, 10 minutes, okay? And so we'll start at 9.50, and we'll just borrow a couple minutes of your time. Uh, apologies, Karen and, and Tim uh, and Evan. 9.50 back here in 10 minutes. Thank you very much.